Hello, welcome to Sock Talk with JNAB and the Sundance Kid. We are going to explore the frontiers of technology, art, and the human experience. Hello, welcome to Sock Talk, episode number 10. John, we made it to double digits. Good lord, double <laughs> digits. Yeah, so, well, that's good. That's um, nine more than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this week, we are going by a topic of why does your art suck? John, why does your art suck? My art sucks for lots and lots of reasons. Yeah. Um, I guess predominantly it's because I don't really do art anymore. Um, and art that you don't do sucks worse than any art you could do. Mm. Yeah. How about you, Jamie? Why does your art suck? <laughs> uh, I, one, I don't get to do it as much as I would like to. Um, that for the same reasons it, it's, it's a skill it's like anything it's like craft it's a muscle depending on what you're creating um if you stop doing it you you will atrophy i think um and i that's one of the biggest reasons i don't sit down and commit the hours i also can't decide what kind of artist i want to be which doesn't help i like one of my unfortunate things is i like too many things uh, that's one of my downfalls so i i <clears throat> I used to be really bad for starting projects and never finishing them again. Now I just don't start projects and I figure, fix that problem. Um, <laughs> it's a sad thing, but I, I totally relate to it. The first couple of decades of my life, the first three decades of my life, my mother was always saying to me, just pick one. Hmm. Just pick one and do that for a while, and then you can change your mind. Because I like to sculpt and paint and draw. And I liked theater and music and all kinds of things on the artistic side. And I couldn't decide. Hmm. And uh, if I were giving advice to my own kids, if I had any, I'd say, don't just choose one. Don't try to find the perfect one. Do them all. Switch back and forth. And the ones that call out to you are the ones you should do. Yeah. And I, I say something atrophies. But if, if you're doing various different uh, forms of expression, let's say, or crafts, you might not get as highly specialized within that craft. But there is an overall creative muscle so to speak i agree uh, yeah i agree i think that it's sort of a, a, a developed fearlessness or something mm. the ability to put out the, th the stuff that you're thinking or imagining without deciding that it has to immediately be erased or binned or something like that yeah i for sure um i, I still have that fear all the time Anything we make, even this podcast, I like have the fear of, uh, it's, it's, well, you know, the standard things that everyone feels. So that's OK. We're going to try and list things and make something useful and practical. Um, <laughs> one of the first things might be that fear uh, that gets in a lot of people's ways. I, I felt this especially more in the beginning um, and especially now because, say, if you're a digital artist, if you're starting out in something like 3D, 3D modeling or 3D animation, which I know quite a bit about you will probably have your favorite artists and you'll go online to something like Behance and they'll have a front page of this amazing pieces of art and craft that you just, there's no way you can compete against that. And it's almost a bit downheartening seeing, but you seeing all of that work and then comparing it against your own. But you have to remember, those are quite often what you're seeing there is people over the 10,000 hours, they're, they're probably 20 years into it. And this is one of their most recent pieces that they've spent a lot of time on. Um, and that can get in the way because it gives you that fear that you're not going to be good in comparison. But the most of us know who are there higher at that level. I'm not saying I'm there higher at that level. Like, we still want to see everyone else starting out. They're, most communities are good, um, I would say. So, all right, what am I saying? Don't be afraid of putting <laughs> out your work. Your, your. Um, and it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be, uh, well, I would say, yeah, put it out anywhere. Put it out, get, get over that fear. The only way you get over a fear is by confronting it. I agree. And you're going to have, you're going to be uncomfortable and you're always going to have an uncomfortable feeling and you're always going to doubt yourself and question yourself, which is fine. That's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, absolutely. It there's lots of interesting conflations that happen uh, between reality and imagination when you're dealing with people's artwork. And uh, it's easy to think that if somebody doesn't like your art, it means they don't like you. Mm. And if your art isn't pleasing to everybody who comments on it, then you've done something wrong. And that's not the case at all. Art is in incredibly uh, subjective, and some people love one thing that other people hate, and so on and so forth. 
it's really hard to get to the point where you can just say, you know what? I made it and I'm okay with it. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be I made it and I love it or I made it and it's the best piece I ever made and now I will go on and make another piece that will be the best piece I ever made. It's just I made it and it's, now it's done. Mm-hmm. Like if this piece is done and I'm going to set it over there and now I'm going to make other pieces and when they're done, I'll set them in other places. It's a very hard attitude to get to, but I think it's really a big part of what defines a professional artist or a professional creator uh, as, to, as opposed to an amateur the ability to finish up and walk away. Um, 100%. Fin- finish things. That That's that is that's a good piece of advice I hear lots of people say all the time. Yeah. Um, because you're never going to be fully satisfied, um, which is good and normal. And that's what drives you to continue on and get better. Right. Um, and, and in fact, if you don't draw the line under something and say, even if this isn't finished, I'm finished with it. Yeah. If you don't do that, then you can't get better because you haven't finished something so that you can learn from it. Yeah, uh, there's there's a famous phrase, art is never finished, it's abandoned. Yes. Yeah, yeah when I was an animator back in the Stone Age, uh, we used to say no project is ever done, it's just due. Yes, there you go. That's, that's the attitude, 100%. Yeah. Um, what would you, if, if you, so let's say you go back in time and you can speak to your, your younger self. Um, you've just given a good bit of advice. What other areas would you would you give advice on? Oh boy, um, I uh, as a kid, as a little kid, I uh, I used to read the comic strips with my dad most every day uh, that he was in town, and uh, I loved the comic strips. I just loved them. Peanuts, Hagar the Horrible all kinds of comic strips like that. And I so wanted to draw them. I wanted to draw them. I I didn't know where the stories would come from. But after a while, I figured out I could do that too. And uh, if I could go back and talk to that little kid, I'd just say, yeah, keep doing that. Just keep doing that. If you um, turn it into something or if you don't, you love it and keep doing it. There was a point in my life when I stopped I started drawing. Um, yeah, we should probably talk about this uh, myth of the 10,000 hours, which is a yeah, really common yeah, myth. Sure. I, I started drawing when I was really little. Uh, my parents both worked, and I'd end up uh, in my mother's office uh, during the parts of the year when we were in the city and not at the farm. I'd end up in my mother's office for hours every afternoon waiting for it to be time to go home. That's where I started drinking coffee. You can see how it stunted my <laughs> growth. And uh, every day, the amusement I had was that I was given a stack of lined paper and a couple of Bic pens, you know, ballpoint pens. So I just drew. I drew all day long before I could write, before I could do anything else. And um, people said to me all through my childhood and teens, wow, you're a really great artist. And I always thought, no, I'm not an artist. I don't have the creativity to be an artist. Mm. But I'm an illustrator. I can illustrate anything you want illustrated. I, I... I guess if I could go back to that little kid, I would say persist at it, keep doing it, and find the storytelling that you think you can't do. Sure. And be that creative person you think you aren't. It's, uh, I don't know what I'd be doing now, but I'm pretty sure we would never have met in the context in which we did. Mm. If, I, if I could, I had a similar experience. I can remember drawing a lot. Um various different things I've, I've, i remember uh, being given bad advice early on well maybe not but <laughs> one, one of the early things i used to get given to me is tracing paper and i trace over things and it's just just keep doing that and then you'll learn it never worked so one of the things i would say for me if i was going to go back learn actually the foundational theory yes you can put in a lot of hours into anything but there are people who've figured things out over time who are willing to teach you and give you shortcuts. Uh, you don't need to sit and just hope that by magic happen chance that you figure all these these tools and techniques out on your own when people are very willing to teach you them and tell you them. And there are great books, there's great YouTube video series, there, there's university with some great <laughs> with some good lectures and here and there. And you know, there, there is that that's what i would say i would be afraid of i don't know why but i'd be afraid of doing that um i totally get it 
I went through the same thing when I was in my tweens. A, a friend I trusted gave me some tracing paper and said, trace all the artists you like and you'll learn. And uh, within about a year, my father gave me a copy of Grey's Anatomy. Not the TV show, the, yeah, the book. anatomy book, which is ill-named by the man who wrote it, not the man who drew it. Um, and uh, I learned so much from going through that and really trying to study how the human body was. After that, I stopped drawing almost everything else for years and just drew people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really bad at backgrounds, but really detailed human anatomy. Yeah, there, there. maybe there's a, a, something else I hear people say is um, figure out what you... We'll stay away from what we're not good at. And sometimes it can hold us back quite a bit. Um, and being honest with yourself and identifying those areas is a good method of growing. Here, here. Uh, not just with art, just anywhere in your life. If, if you're terrified to do any form of public speaking, that's, that's a shining light telling you that you need to train a little bit more in that area because, it, yeah, th- those those... Fears are quite often telling you something where there's value to be had I, by I, pursuing. I agree. And even if it's just as simple as um, as being more comfortable in the world, mm. if something scares you, learn more about it. I, I don't know if it's because of childhood experiences with firearms or if it's just because of a lifelong obsession with Batman, but I grew up hating handguns, mm. just hating them. So the first chance I got, I joined a gun club. So I could learn all about them, how to take them apart, how they worked, how to make ammunition, um, how to get really good at handling them, and then also in the course of all that, how to fire them. Um, but I, I became so certainly nowhere near an expert, but I became very comfortable around handguns, and I no longer hated them. I still hate how people use them. I wish they didn't exist. But um, since they do, at least I feel a bit safer now if one suddenly appears. Well, you'd be surprised right now behind this door. <laughs> Nikki, come in. It's uh, it's happened to me three times. Oh, boy. Uh, twice people have pointed handguns at me. One time I was there when someone pointed it at someone else. Okay. You yeah. know, perception is, <laughs> with art, very, very important element. Um, not just for you creating something to show to people and... Uh, by the end of whatever it is, uh, and you're going to try and use tools and methods to make people perceive it in some way to try and make them feel something. But whilst you're making something, your own perception can get in your own way. So one of the early tips people will give, especially with digital drawings, is very easy, is once you've got a drawing or a graphic design or something, is to flip it. And in just that process of flipping it, you'll see something that, like, how on earth did I not notice that thing was unaligned? Lovely. And it's just that dog cocking of the head thing. Nice. Um, to just, just view it from a different angle. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, since you bring that up, I should probably mention that I just told this story without any reference to historical documents. So I could be completely wrong. What I talked about was my current perception mm. based on the perception I had at the time. Yeah. Part of the creative process, uh, I'll use film, for example, just because I'm familiar with that and we're making one right now so it's in my head you whenever you're creating something you know everything whatever there is to know about this story if there is anything to know about it you're the one who knows everything about it and you're going to be at first writing it then shooting it then editing it making it for an audience who doesn't know so we value a lot fresh eyes in the industry we call them fresh eyes. Uh, people who don't, are not attached in any way, don't know any lore, don't know any background, don't know anything about the characters. And then as a part of the creative process is handing it to someone with fresh eyes to get their genuine uh, immediate input because it's very, very valuable. We do it in the script writing stage. Once you've got your first pass, fire off to a bunch of different people, get feedback. Then once you've shot it and got your first cut, well, even... Before then, you work with your actors, get their perception of the characters, um, and the letting go of, especially in that art form, letting go of control is what being a good filmmaker is all about. Because you've got to, for the most, unless you're doing absolutely everything on your own, which is rare, you're going to be giving it to other people. You've got to let it be as much theirs as it is yours. 
And so as a director, sure, you're going to direct them in some directions, but you're going to open it up to let that other person find things that you can't and bring it in together, kind of a hive mind sense of making something larger as a creative output. And yeah, once you've got your edit, you're going to pass it on to other people with fresh eyes because it might not make sense. It might have made perfect sense to you that in the third act, that gun has that guns now in that child's hand, but you forgot to write it in in the first scene, and without that, the audience is going to go, "Where did that come from? What's going on there? That doesn't make sense." And it made sense to you because you you knew it was there, but you forgot to tell the audience. Right. So you have to get Mr. Chekhov to introduce exactly. it in the first scene. I think one hundred percent exactly why I chose the gun. Yeah, but, nicely done. Um, yeah, I think all of. All of creativity, if you're intending to share it beyond your own experience, is a story that you're going to be sharing with someone. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they're going to be able to tell the story themselves or the piece that you've created will tell them the story. And I I think that perspective that you were just speaking from, the fact that you're giving it to them, the audience, they have fresh eyes. So you need to have fresh eyes earlier to know how they read it. I, I really like that very much. I remember when I was teaching animation, uh, again, uh, maybe not the Stone Age, maybe the Bronze Age. Um, the uh, I rem- In one of the first classes I ever taught, I said to the students, now, when you share your storyboards with the class and with me, you have to be able to tell the story just with what you've got on paper. So don't describe it. Don't yeah. use any yeah. words at all. Don't make any sounds. Don't point at anything. You have to be able to hand it to someone and they'll understand it. And uh, then I did a demonstration for the class and quickly sketched up a storyboard. I think it was uh, two parallel storyboards. They might still be in my online portfolio somewhere. One of human characters uh, emoting heavily, one really close to the camera, one further away. And then the same thing done again with Mo Sislik in the distance and Homer up close uh, to show the, the very different, how much you can exaggerate posture and facial expression when it's cartoons. And the first thing I did was to start explaining that to the class. And a couple of the students said, um, shouldn't it be able to tell us what it's telling us without you using any words? <laughs> and like, oh, wow, okay, thanks, thanks. Yep. Yes, indeed, if you'll pardon an obscure Navy reference, I was hoist by my own petard. Yep, yep. That's That's a very, very good tool, forcing people to not use other methods. We had something similar where when one of our last writing groups, we were two, one, one group went away and everything that would come back from them would be very, very dialogue heavy to the point where everything was in a dialogue. And then I did, when I got it back, I just said, write it again with no dialogue, absolutely zero dialogue. Tell this whole story just through action. Um, to force them to start thinking about, okay, right, how how do I do that? How do you how do you tell, even, uh, how, how, yeah, how do you communicate what someone is feeling just visually? Well, that's cinema. That's the whole point. And some think about how everything, the mise en scene, the the colors, the emotions, the actions. What are they doing? Absolutely everything to communicate, rather than like we're doing right now in a podcast. Um, which is the inverse, where it's only dialogue. Um, <laughs> or if you could look, if you're watching right now, I'm, I'm not at all animated, and it's not very cinematic. But, yeah, it's, it's a fun tool. I, I, I accidentally became better. I don't know if I became better. I've no, I don't think I, I was never good at writing dialogue. Um, and I've, I've been... I'm, I'm lucky that... So one of my skills is visual effects, um, which is a blessing and a curse because there's that phrase "fix it in post." If you've heard of it, oh yeah, yeah. So when you're when you when you have some of those skills um, and things aren't going your way, you, you at the back of your mind you're just like, I could just change this later. Do I need to? <laughs> do I need? To? It's, it's a bad idea because it costs. It, it takes a lot of time and energy to do it. But with one of my films, I I, I, I wasn't happy with the majority of the dialogue i cut out probably 70 percent of it in my film wow um just because it was it was bad writing on my part um it wasn't anything to do with anyone else i take full responsibility for it but then i 
I wouldn't say I fixed it. I was talking about why your art sucks. I hate I hate everything about everything I do, but <laughs> I did make it at least better. I can at least you you still got to give yourself the pats on the back every now and then as well. You can't just beat yourself up completely, um, which I do quite a lot. I mostly just beat myself up, um, but. Uh, I, I forced myself, well, not, again, not forced, but I became much better visually at communicating things. Um, so in that film, the, within the first minute, I communicate uh, a lot of information just through just through the imagery and editing rather than any dialogue at all, which is uh, better in most cases, I think. I, I agree completely. Um, I was just trying to remember the names of a couple of folks who have uh, given me advice directly or indirectly over the years. Um, and I started looking at my phone and then realized that's just the wrong way to do this. We are not looking things up. We'll fix that in post if there's <laughs> references to put here. But um, there's a great American writer. There was a great American writer who uh, died about 10 years ago. He uh, wrote the books that Justified is based on, the TV series Justified, or just the sequel Justified City Primeval. He wrote the novel Get Shorty. Um, Leonard, Elmore Leonard. Sorry, it took me a little while. Elmore Leonard wrote advertising copy for a living and then started writing westerns and eventually managed to become the best dialogue writer in American popular fiction largely recognized as that. The first dozen or so films Hollywood made based on his films, uh, based on his novels, they rewrote the script entirely. And it, it wasn't until uh, somebody realized, no, we've got to preserve his dialogue as much as we can, that the film suddenly became award-winning. Um, his dialogue is exceptional. He advances the story with almost no description of what's going on in the room except people reacting to it. Mm. But that's so freaking rare. Most other writers will tell you to do exactly the opposite. Right? Set a scene. Set the scene so well that the person is there. And then let it happen. Don't overdo the, the writing, right? Um, was, it, was it Stephen King who said, uh, don't use any adverbs? Uh, pass. Okay, I think that might have been Stephen King. Hey, audience, let us know. Um if if you don't mind, uh, Mom, I, I know you're busy being dead and all, but um, don't know who else is listening or watching. Um, Are you in the room right now? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, uh, in terms of writing, there's lots and lots of great advice out there. Uh, some of it saying be heavy in dialogue if you are as good as Elmer Leonard. Mm. Otherwise, try to do everything you can without it. Certainly in, in film or in, in visual storytelling, I, I agree with you completely. If you can tell the story without a single word, that's probably best. Um, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen Will Eisner's book on graphic storytelling. He's the guy some people say did the first graphic novel. Um, he's the one who invented the spirit uh, back uh, just post-World War II. Um, American uh, comic writer. Uh, if, you have, if you don't know his work, I strongly suggest you take out, uh, you, you check out the graphic novel, A Contract with God, um, it's exceptional. Um, but anything by Will Eisner is exceptional. So he, he wrote a, a textbook, basically, on how to tell visual stories. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the kings of it. I, I um, had the good chance to, to meet him and chat with him briefly uh, in his latter years when I was still trying to be a comic book artist. Um, I also had the chance to take a, a, a weekend course from uh, Joe Kubert, was another great visual storyteller. He invented that style you see a lot in comics now, especially being a fan of manga, uh, you see it there, um, where you have a single scene, a single background, foreground, everything, but split across several yeah. panels, and you can see the characters moving through the scene. Yeah. That was Kubert who invented that. Um, just absolutely beautiful. Scott McCloud, who did a couple of really great um, alternative comics or alt comics as they were called in the 80s and 90s and then wrote two of the best textbooks in visual uh, uh, visual storytelling ever uh, understanding comics and I think the sequel is making comics anyway those are all great things for people to look up if they want to know more about visual storytelling because um, yeah if if you do it right you don't need sound effects. You mm -hmm. don't need special effects. Nothing needs to be fixed in post. And 
it saves a lot of money and time when you're making a film, like you were saying, if you don't have to fix it in post. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, it also forces you to think a lot more about what you're going to do, what your storytelling choices are beforehand. And we've said it before at the, pod, at the in this podcast, both of us, the prep time you spend before you touch any hardware or software, that's in direct relation to how good the outcome is. 100%. If, if you're just diving in um, without any sort of prerequisite. I mean, if you, if you just turned out with all the cameras in the room with no script, <laughs> I mean, that's just... As a documentary um, at that point. <laughs> yeah, it's very, cinema very verite. different. Um, yeah, but that's one of the reasons that people's artwork sucks mm -hmm. is because we've got all these amazing toys now that let us make art, mm -hmm. whether it's music or whether it's uh, 3D images, 2D images, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, modified photos, anything that makes it too easy to do without reflection means that a lot of people are making a lot of work without thinking about it beforehand. And that means they're not taking advantage of, of that prior knowledge that you mentioned a little while ago. 100%. I, I am guilty as charged. That, that, I remember very early on getting into 3D modeling and whatnot. I would find, I, I would spend so many time trying to find add-ons, tools, textures, this, that, things that will try and make it easier for me rather than just focusing, not even focusing on my foundational skills, just focusing on what, what the hell do you want to make? Why are, why are you gathering all these tools and techniques and material texture packs and all of this? I'll be like, oh, that'll be great. I'll keep all this together. And then s spending more time than that than actually making stuff, <laughs> which is stupid. Uh, you don't need... It's, it's something we say when we're doing, when we're teaching filmmaking and video production and things as well. It doesn't matter how good your camera is. You can, if you give an iPhone to some of the greatest filmmakers in the world, they will make a great film. Full stop. Absolutely. Don't let your tools get in the way. Um, because you need to know what you're doing in the first place, which is more important. What do you want to say? What, it, what is this act that you're doing? What do you need to communicate to other people? Right. Don't let your tools get in the way is a really important phrase. I'm, I'm sorry, I sort of interrupted you there. No, I, no. I just want to jump on that before we go on. It's important because it works in two directions. Your tools can get in the way because they're too limited. Yeah. And so you convince yourself that they're not good enough. Or they can get in the way because they're too freaking good. And so you convince yourself you've got to use them to their extremes. Um, you know the filmmaker uh, Darren Aronofsky? Um, I think I've got his name right. Aronofsky? Um, and a big time movie maker now, director, producer, etc. His first film was made uh, and shot on a Super 8, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Um, it's all he had. He raised the money he could. All he could use was this very, very shaky handheld camera. So he made a film in which the shakiness of the camera would assist the storytelling. It's about a guy who's falling into paranoia and doesn't know if this conspiracy he's uncovered is just paranoia or is real. So the fact that the camera is shaky all the time just is brilliant. Now, when I saw it, when it was first released, people left the theater complaining, it's making me nauseous. And it was. Yeah. But he used it deliberately as a storytelling technique. 100%. Yeah, you're, your own limitations can sometimes be tools as well. Uh, even... Recently, I noticed myself, I was on, on a Zoom call, and I was doodling for the first time in a long time. And I was just looking at it, I was like, hey, it's interesting. It's not great by any means, but I look at it and I go, uh, it's, it's something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there's something there. Um, and that's just with, yeah, no tools. When we're talking about, yeah, what are you going to do? That's, that's something It's look, who the hell am I to be giving anyone advice in this in the first place? But... A lecturer at a university whose job is to give people advice? That's a good point. Um, thanks, John. <laughs> but I, I, I still look at myself as got a long, long way to go with most things. I, I'm, everything I make can be a lot better. Good. Please but, keep feeling that way. Yeah. But um, when I direct best is when I don't have to worry about everything else. So I've done a lot of indie filmmaking because I've had to and I wanted to make films so bad 
with these grand stories, I just had to do everything. I had to figure out everything. I had to figure out how to do the effects, how to film, how to edit. So I'm very skilled in all of those, all of the fields of filmmaking because I had to, because I, I had nobody else um, around me. And then over time, as I have developed communities and um, other creatives around me, one, that's the ownership thing we're talking about before. One is giving up ownership and letting other people do what they're best at or just even accept they're going to do that so you can focus. And when I'm at my best in directing is when I'm literally just focusing on what are we doing in this scene? What's the feeling? And you really have to put yourself in that space and bring everyone else with you especially the actors because you got to forget all the tools and cameras and crew around us we we need to go into this space and become it and what that space means i mean what you're seeing on the final film that a great film the actors are there 100 percent. okay sure there might be something at the back of their head they're thinking of other things but it needs to be as authentic as it can be and the director's job is to quite often help people get there and communicate to everyone and you've got to be there yourself because as a director you've got to feel if it wasn't and if it wasn't there it's your job to make sure to get it there um because you're the one that everyone stops after this is cut everyone looks to you and they're like did we get it and what is it that that's a question some people just when you start out i'd usually just be yeah that shot looked pretty <laughs> that's not what we're looking for it doesn't even matter if it went out of focus at some point what you should be caring about more was what what did you feel it what was the energy what you were trying to communicate what was that there and that that's and i'm still bad for it because you can get caught up especially on a busy set you can get caught up and you're rushing and things are going in there and it's 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 a very hard thing to stay in the space that you need to be in yeah i can only imagine I, i've directed some tv commercials and bits of animation here and there. I've never directed a film. Um, aspired to it, but uh, never saw it as something I could take uh, take on successfully. But I, I, can, I can only imagine how very, very challenging it must be to maintain all those different perspectives at once. Mm. Running the set, uh, checking the work of all of the individuals, doing all of the very separate tasks, making sure all of that is going and keeping track of a story that really only exists in your head yeah. and seeing how it meshes up with the story all of these different professionals are telling. that and, I am greatly appreciative and admiring of your skills. Well, it could be better. Um, the yeah, skills, yeah, but... Just, the, the, just, just take the compliment. I'll take it. All right. One pat on the back. On. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, it's so easy to get taken out of it and... It, I was <laughs> laughing, thinking um, it, what you're saying. It, it's so exhausting. Um, it, it's weirdly exhausting because it, you're you're dealing with a thousand things the whole time. Your brain is on overdrive the whole way through if you're doing it well. Um, I remember the last film that we did, me and Nikki co-directed. Um, everyone on lunch, like lunch would come. Everyone's in like speaking to each other, enjoying the thing. Me and Nikki are in another room, just zoned out. Like, give me no more noise like i can't like, my brain needs to have nothing right now because the whole time when you're on it you're just switched on completely um keeping track of everything there's other industries and people who do this way more than um a f- blooming filmmaker but uh yeah that uh, there there's different ways of doing it. every you, you listen to different directors they've all got their own different percept perceptive well um perspective on it um Oh gosh, what direct, what filmmaker was I hearing that said uh, one of the things that they do specifically to get actors to deliver something better is do it again, but stop acting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just say the words. Like, what do you mean? No, I'm acting. No, no, no. Just, just say the words. Nice. That's all you need to do. Just say the words um, to try and get it as real as possible. Um, I think that was Fincher's films. Um, potentially, um, because that's the real world. Nobody, quite often, people are boring in the way they communicate. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't always have to be. It, we talked before here uh, with some of our guests about the uncanny valley, mm-hmm. 
and that's a constant danger when you're using human actors to tell a human story, is the least little bit of uh, dyssynchrony or asynchrony uh, between what they're doing and what the audience anticipates them doing either is enchanting or breaks the illusion completely. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's one of the things I love about it is that, uh, that tightrope that the story is walking the whole time. Yeah. How do you do things that are unpredictable in a way that keeps the audience engaged and builds their anticipation instead of snapping them out of it? Mm-hmm. It's, it's marvelous. Yeah. All right. I had a question lined up for you, John. Uh-oh. What is the, what are you most proud of artistically that you've ever made? Holy smokes. Wow, that's um, that's a big question. Anything, Probably something you've not thought about. Yeah, anything I say as an answer here, um, I may disagree with upon further reflection. Of course. Um, artistically, you mean across the arts? Yeah, and anything you've created that you're most proud of. Wow, I've, I've done some things I'm quite proud of, some comic art, um, some illustrations, a couple of paintings, some poetry. Oh, man. I think probably from a purely artistic standpoint, um, and I don't mean, er, I shy quite artistic, but, you know, like um, something that was generated for the purpose of telling a story. Um, I wrote a novel, a, a children's novel, based on Norwegian folk tales that my father used to tell us when we were kids. He told them for years, and then I took over telling them to my younger siblings. And I carried them in my heart. When I was a school teacher, I used to tell them to my students. And uh, I finally decided about uh, 15, 20 years ago that I had to get those down. Yeah, 20 years ago or more now. But I had to get those down and do something with them. So I wrote the first novel entirely. uh, uh, Tip of the hat to NaNoWriMo, the national novel, writing, uh, write a novel in a month. thing uh, that has changed quite a bit in the last few years, but uh, got me through writing that novel. Um, So yeah, it's a full novel. Um, I wrote it, uh, roughed it out in a month, finished it, edited it all in later stages, and then illustrated it. So uh, every chapter has one illustration, and I painted the cover. And uh, I am extremely proud of that. It sat in the hands of an agent in New York who was getting ready to retire, for a year when he was deciding whether or not he would represent it and try to get me published. And after a year, he wrote back to me and said, I really like the character and I really like the way you tell the story, but I'm not in love with it. Mm. I turned it down. Mm. And that broke my heart and I didn't do anything with it for years after that. If anyone listening or if either of you in the room happened to know a literary agent who would be willing to look at a children's story, I would dearly love to get that published. Um, since I wrote the first one, I have blocked out the four other novels in the series. The protagonist starts off at age four, and there's a new novel every four years. Well, there's fear, John. Why have you, why have you not already done it? Yeah. Get, send it out. I just can't do it. Yeah. I can't do it. it. It comes back to something that I think we've talked about before, which is my absolute certainty that if I don't take the chance of failing, hmm. it will not have failed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is a horrible it. lesson I learned as a little kid and mm. in some things still cling to to this day. I mean, not in most things in my life, or I wouldn't have done 90% of what I've done in my life, but uh, that story is very personal and it still feels mm. that way to me. I'm sure. I'd rather not have the heartbreak of having it turned down again. Well, there's self publishing these days. That's what people have been telling me yeah. for more than a decade. And I actually went so far as to do the full layout of the book so that I could self publish mm-hmm. before deciding I didn't want to. Fair enough. I don't know. Probably the wrong choice. How many stories like that are there around the world? How many masterpieces oh, maybe have man. existed? The um, was it a Spanish painter who's going mad. The the Kronos eating his baby. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget the name of the painter, but he was going mad in his later years. And you know the painting I'm talking about. Kronos, I don't know. Kronos eating a baby. Um, it's 
coming out of the shadows. It's basically you, you painted it on as well, um, and it got covered up, and no one noticed it for years until they found it again. And they, you, you had just paint, made these absolute. What would be the word? I don't know. I do. What, what a good. Uh, that's just. That's just my badly articulate I am right now of a way of communicating <laughs> but the haunting is one word maybe haunting but they draw you in these these paintings um and yeah it was just he he no one ever knew them until they found them on the wall wow. um he just did them on his own we'll put up a picture of it now in this little corner there good idea yep. good idea you, you will have seen it you will have seen it no doubt um, if you want you can put up a little it's a famous uh, one of them um, chronos but he's like a weathered old man with just to eat, finish eating a baby. Yeah, I think I, I'm recognizing the imagery. Please put up a face palm logo next to it, or a little uh, emoji of face palm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. I should know the name. I, I'm so bad with names. This is where. Yeah, there's two guys who are bad with names. That should be the new name of our podcast. Podcast. Yeah. What was that name again? <laughs> that should be. The, 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 yeah, it's, it's so bad as well because I feel like I. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm getting less articulate over time. And it's a muscle, Jamie. You yeah, have to practice. It's, that's it. That's it. I noticed. I, I noticed us our first sock talk, and I was flowing a bit better. But then we were mid semester, right. and I've been lecturing a lot, communicating a lot. Then now after summer, it's muscles True. gone down a bit. It only makes sense. Maybe only makes sense. We'll say that it's not all the alcohol I drink. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Especially since it's whiskey week here in Aberdeen. Yes, yes. Um, we've okay. We fit. We fit uh, quite a few, hopefully useful um, tips for some people. Um, and I guess this podcast is mainly addressed to people who are starting out because anyone who's good at their craft are probably better than me, at least. Uh, so <laughs> you don't need advice from me. But people who are very, very much just starting out. Um, it's bits and pieces of advice for for you guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to step in there during your um. Please do. Uh, because I disagree strongly with what you just said. Not just the fact that you were self-disparaging again, which you do a lot. Um, and it's fine. If that's what you want to do, you go ahead. But I will call you out on it from time to time. Sure. Um, I tell my students that the greatest thing ever invented by humans, the greatest deliberate invention by humans is the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Because the scientific method is where you put your ego aside and you find the smartest and most knowledgeable people you can and ask them to tell you what you did wrong. And that's how we advance knowledge, is by trying to disprove what we believe, getting as many smart and knowledgeable people as possible to try to disprove what we believe, on defined terms, not just nya nya, we don't like you, right? It has to be on defined terms. And if you can disprove it, then we know to abandon it. And if you can't disprove it, then we know that we can build on top of it, at least for a while. I believe that this applies in creative measures as well, and that everyone, no matter their experience and no matter their skills and no matter what uh, they've produced so far, including beautiful pieces and wonderful, inspiring, uh, fear-evoking pieces, Everyone learns from reviewing the same basic information again and again because we tend to forget it. We're humans and we're flawed and we need a whole bunch of peers reminding us all the time of our best practices. Yeah. yeah. So those of you who are much better at this stuff than me or Jamie, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, made me, that made me think of one of the things that gets in my way the most is... Hmm. How do I articulate this? Almost a dishonesty. Um, where, what? Because the act of being creative, you've got to tap into this raw element within you. And I know this is imprecise and abstract, um, but I'm going on a feeling here. At least, at least for when directing is maybe where I feel it most. Um, you've got to tap down into this raw creative space and not let yourself get in your own way. Uh, you've probably felt it before with that's kind of flow state a little bit as well. You'll feel you'll felt it when you're writing. Sometimes you don't know where it's coming from, but it's coming from somewhere. And then the second something else comes into your brain, boom, it's gone. 
And I mean, this is what people used to call the divine and we'd, you know, people would relate this to being closer to God or what other various different forms of referring to it. People have articulated this much better than me, but you can get there. um, And the only person who's not going to let you get there is yourself. There is going to be other people that will tell you things and criticize and do that, but you're the one listening to them. You're the one who's listening to them and taking those things on. And there's a, there's a freedom that comes from learning to let go, uh, which is very, very hard to do. I've seen some people slip too far on that letting go. Um, you still need to keep yourself attached to reality a little bit. But yeah, what do you think? <laughs> I, I agree with you completely. I, I, um, I think it's an interesting process, that deep creativity. Mm. Uh, people would say... Uh, in in, uh, the, in the lilac age, they would say uh, he was writing like a man possessed, mm-hmm. right, or working like a man possessed. Uh, so sometimes it's the divine that's touching you, and sometimes it's something else. It's the the monkey on your back, mm-hmm. right, or the succubus on your shoulder. Um, the, the, this this style of putting forth so much all at once, being deeply immersed in it, it is very much mm-hmm. what uh, what is called flow. Uh, thanks to uh, Mihaly, Chikshek Mihaly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do think there's other sides to it, though. Um, it, it It is wonderful to go into it. Like you say, it's great if you're a creative person, if you can tap into it as deeply as possible, as long as you keep coming back. Yeah, yeah. Because failing to come back is uh, the road to perdition, as some might say. It's certainly not going to be comfortable for you or for the people who love you. Um, on the other hand there's also failing to get going you said that the only person who's stopping you is you and i think for 99 percent of the people who might hear this podcast and for uh, almost 100 percent of those who don't yes that's the same number um that's true however we are also constantly interrupted by the traveling salesman who won't stop knocking at our door right when you're busy writing down uh, or dreaming up uh in Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure tome decree, right? Um, if, if you're writing that poem and a, a blasted door-to-door salesman won't stop banging on mm-hmm. your door, interrupts you, and you never manage to finish the poem, as is the case in that example, um, then that connection is lost. And maybe you can go into the realm again, but not with that connection. Whatever elements were going on that were feeding into you or that you were feeding from... Uh, those are now different, and that story can no longer be finished. Which is one of the reasons I hate open concept offices, <laughs> right? Um, great studies have been done about it. If you are in an open concept office, you tend to average less than half an hour of work a day. Yeah. Yeah. Because every single thing going on around you interrupts you. And if you are trying to do something in a deep flow state, something creative or something truly productive where you're at your best, anything that interrupts you will take at least 20, 25 minutes for you to get back to. Yeah, build up the momentum. So even if, yeah, well, momentum or depth or whatever it is, build up the connections, build up the lack of connections. If, If you study the neuropsychology of flow, it's really quite interesting. And I've got some theories about that that I haven't had the opportunity to try to disprove yet. But it seems to me that the resources that you usually spend in, say, uh, blocking out a story, uh, the resources that you usually spend in doing that are quite limited. There are certain parts of your brain that are good at that kind of thing. But if you can get deeply enough into it, then all of the little processors that are worrying about the room around you, that are worrying about, uh, have I eaten yet this morning, and when do I have to use the toilet next, and what is my uh, my partner thinking right now, and all those other distracting thoughts, they all fall aside, and all of the resources that are processing those things focus instead on helping you block out the story. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why you lose sense of time. That's why you lose sense of personal space. That's why you lose... Uh, sense of discomfort in your in your limbs or in your digestive system. Um, I, I've told stories about that to you before, and I think on the podcast before. Um, when you go into flow, you're vastly more productive for the same reason 
that you feel like the rest of the world has disappeared or that you've fallen into another world. It's because your sensory perceptions aren't happening anymore. Mm -hmm. Instead, all of those resources are drawn into helping you accomplish something great. Uh, anyone who's played a video game and gotten completely caught up into it and done better than they thought they could have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. You're suddenly using resources to imagine what's next in the game, anticipate it, and take the appropriate actions with just exactly the precise timing that allows you to succeed and go on to the next level where it's just a little bit more difficult and a little bit more demanding, specifically because it's designed to bring you into flow. So if, if you've played that kind of a game and you've been lost in it, the reason you lose track of time, the reason that your partner or your parents or your children get upset with you because you were gone all night and you really thought you were only playing for 15 minutes is because your innate sense of time Yes, humans have much more than six or seven senses or five. Your innate sense of time disappeared because those resources were busy helping you win the game. Or tell the story, or write about uh, Xanadu. And maybe that's what I was trying to articulate a bit with the honesty. Um, you're being dishonest to whatever it is that we're talking about here, that depth that you're going into. If, if you're worrying about anything else, you're not being true to it. You, you, and we all kind of know it and feel it because most, I'm pretty sure everyone listening has seen someone perform in some sense, be it um, act in a play or perform music. If someone's not there and not fully in it, you can feel it. It's, it's, it's not quite there. And then when people truly are and they're 100% synchronized to that low zone that's when people truly shine for no better word yeah. and you can that's what you you know this when it's what you look for you need you need people being 100 percent committed and very they're at their very best in a given moment i agree completely and i, I think it, I, I agree with you and i think the terms are interesting hmm. because it is 100 percent committal it, it that's what comes across is yeah. that you are fully invested in doing what you're doing and yet I think if you were thinking about it consciously and trying to be committed, those thoughts are too slow for it to work. Yeah. It has to be something much faster than that, something in one of the other processing centers of your brain that isn't as as slow and ponderous as that. Yeah. Okay, and I'm, I've just figured out another part of my honesty thing, which annoys me with, with myself Excellent. a little bit as well, is making things that aren't even truly resonant with me. Um, <laughs> like I'm not... With, with art and maybe film or writing or especially maybe writing songs or anything, if you're not writing about something which you genuinely feel, have felt, then what are you doing? Yeah, uh, making commercial work and getting rich, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I, I've noticed your last few examples have been about music and writing, and I can't help but wonder if that's because of what I'm doing tonight. No, no, not at all. It's just, it's just an easy, it's just such an easy, visceral one to understand. Phew! Thank goodness it's just no, my ego getting no, in the way. No, <laughs> no um, but the greatest artists in the world, the greatest songs in the world, they're deeply, deeply personal to a human experience, um, and they resonate so much with other people because because of that. Yeah, I, um, and that's the. Art, that's where I go with art. The art, the best art is when someone's being truly honest to something that they felt. They've not let themselves get in the way in how they're communicating it. Yeah. Even though they are communicating themselves, paradoxically. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true synchronization with a feeling and using artistic tools to try and communicate that feeling to other people. Yeah. Um, it, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's just what what you were saying there really resonates. And I, as always, you're using these great turns of phrase that I agree with, but then I also find some disagreement in mm -hmm. them because they're such cool turns of phrase. Um, you, you said, ironically, it's also you communicating yourself. Mm. But that's how we lie all the time. Yeah. Every yeah. lie we tell to ourselves and to others is a misrepresentation of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we do it constantly, all the time. It's it's part of being a human being, right? Uh, when a, a little baby refuses or a small toddler refuses to be put to bed because they're not tired, 
right? What they're really saying is, I don't want to be excluded from what's going on with you giants, right? Mm. But and the way they tell it is to say, I'm not tired. Yeah, and this 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 honesty that I'm exploring here, um, it's not just art where you see it getting in the way. It's normal human communication too. Yeah. And especially in workplaces, <laughs> I can't stand the dishonesty in most workplaces that I've been in. Um, even in myself, I just it's like you fall into a role, you fall into a pattern, and people not saying the obvious sometimes, like the emperor has no clothes, for example. Um, and th- th- I feel like it's a similar thing, that kind of dishonesty. I, I agree. Uh, some people say... Uh, that society is bound by the lies they agree to share, hmm. right? And so we, we are a society if we have agreed to support common illusions or delusions. Yeah. Right. Um, it's, boy, I love it when we get into this stuff that, that isn't easy to answer. Yes. Um, and I hope that folks listening aren't expecting that either of us are going to come up with the simple answer to this. No, The no. simple answer to this is... Man, keep thinking about this long after we've stopped thinking about it. Yeah. Who knows what you'll find. But yeah, the um, the need for dishonesty in order to have things go smoothly, mm-hmm. I, I think, is a, a fundament of society, and it's a fundament of every workplace, and it's a fundament of dealing with yourself. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, how much would I hate myself if I had to be brutally honest with my limit uh, about my own limitations and biases and mistakes? Yeah, and I feel like there's 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 lies we all need to continue operating. Like I know there is. I'm trying to think of an example though. Um, I'm struggling to think of an example. <laughs> well, it depends on how much of an example you want. Yeah. Right. The, the the really simple one from the terms of science is um, how does gravity work, mm. right? Uh, things like that. Uh, the, uh, I'll see you at sunset, mm. right? There, there's lots of examples like that where these are just convenient lies we tell because it makes it easier to function. Sure. Will the sun set at 6 o'clock tonight? No, the sun will never freaking set. Don't mm. be silly. Earth is rotating around the sun, right? And sure. It's rotating sure. around its own axis and we get an illusion of the sun setting. But much <clears throat> much more in line with the kind of thing you're talking about there's the lies we tell ourselves about things like i can do this yeah i can get through this oh it's just for a couple of hours mm-hmm. right um think of anything you've ever been asked to do that you didn't want to do right? yeah okay then yeah there's the way i find to do those is uh do the things you don't want to do like you love them uh that's the best way to try and get around things that you need you know you need to do some things you yeah. can Uh, at the time, everybody said self-talk that's positive is really, really good for you as an athlete. Talk yourself up. Come on, I can do this. Come on, you you can do it. You can do it. Come on, harder, harder, right? Like the people coaching you and mm. uh, doing a press or something. Um, what he found was that negative self-talk worked even better among certain athletes. Yeah. And I, I, I am unable to go into the details even if I wanted to right now. But, yeah, these disparaging lies, <laughs> insults about your own ability to perform the task you're here to do. I've I found that with myself, for example, if I go in for a run, that's a positive stuff doesn't work at all for me. But if I overly critical and say, you know, the hor- most horrible things in my head to myself, <laughs> it, it does bring an energy for me that my body goes, I'll show you, shut up brain. <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. Last uh, November, when I was in Denmark working at the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies for a month, 
I shared an office with my colleague Lucas Esterle, who I've mentioned before and will continue to mention probably for the rest of my days. Um, and he noticed something that I hadn't noticed that I had developed during the pandemic because of the accident I was in, where I got all that nerve damage. Um, we're working, sharing a desk, sitting opposite each other like co-programmers or something. And uh, at one point he said, I don't know why it's changing, but you went from saying, come on, uh, come on, John, to come on, hand, to come on, mouse, to come on, cursor. <laughs> and as the nerve damage was asserting itself and it became more and more painful for me to function on simple things using the computer, I had to more greatly abstract the control I was trying to assert. Mm. So I knew I couldn't control my arm anymore, but I could freaking control the computer. I can't, no, I can't control the mouse, but I could control the cursor, damn it. <laughs> and it, it was just this strategy to get through these horribly frustrating mm. times that I had developed without realizing it. But that, in a way, was lying to myself yeah. and doing negative self-talk at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, too much negative self-talk. We've <laughs> killed the enthusiasm in the room. No, no, no. I was just going to buy I was, I was just breathing out for, um, I don't know, breath. But I was looking at my list of, I've already gone through it, um, stripping things away. What, what is creativity, John? Wow. Um, what, do, what do we mean? We keep, I use it all the time. I used to call myself a creative director. Um, for the longest time, I still call myself a creative director. Um, I call myself a creative in many ways, but what on earth am I meaning? Well, the difference between a creative director and a director is a certain uh, decrease in responsibility and increase in salary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, create, create. It's 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 probably Latin. <laughs> well, if, <laughs> there's if probably you... some interesting etymology into the word. I'm, I'm... Sure there is. If you want to look at what the word um, means in terms of its application, mm. right? Um, to be creative means to do something that isn't intuitively obvious, mm. I think. Uh, so you're coming up with new paths, new directions, new interpretations of the things around you. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good way to define it in some sense. Come branching out um, yeah. from, from established paths. Possibly, um, no, I think we're both very spatial thinkers, uh, which might be confusing for some of the people listening. Possibly you're branching out, possibly you're branching in. Or crossing branches. Yeah, you may be filling yeah. in a space where there's a gap. You may be reaching out in new directions, or you may be finding new connections between areas that already exist. And what is that space we're branching out into? Um, it depends on who's hiring you or <laughs> which project you're working on or which uh, opium dream you're having when the salesman is knocking on your door. Um, this is, I'm getting platonic um, thinking here. What are there? Do, is there a space where thoughts exist? Okay, that's too platonic for me. <laughs> I am just a shadow on the cave wall. Yeah, yeah. I was going back to, uh, I think we discussed something similar in our first first podcast. Um, but have, have you ever read, I, I ask you this almost every podcast, hoping for a new answer each time. Have you ever read Robert Heinlein? No, no, I'm sorry. So Robert Heinlein wrote a great novel called The Number of the Beast. Um, spoiler alerts now for a 70-year-old novel. Um and you wonder why I haven't read it. <laughs> One of the things that is slowly uncovered by the main cast of characters is that every fictional world that they love exists yeah. in reality as part of a multiverse. Um, so they are themselves fictons, uh, uh, is the natural corollary. If, if all of these people exist in their world inside books, probably they exist inside these other worlds inside of books. Um, and he uses that as a way to tie together all of the fiction he's ever written yep. and to bring in his favorite writers and his friends from his long life and tie mm -hmm. them all together into a story. Recently, fairly recently, within the last 10 years or so, long after his death in the 80s, it was found that he had written two novels at the same time. 
The Number of the Beast, and a sister novel that tells the same story. Uh, um, what is it? The, uh, the Flight of the Pancara or something like that, it's called. Anyway, I just finished reading it um, while recovering from my latest injury. And uh, my gosh, he has the same characters go through the same story up until they start hopping the multiverse, and then they just make one different decision. Mm. And so okay. the second novel is the same story, but going off on a different branch, um, possibly tying into the same ending. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. that's up to the reader to decide. That's always fine. I like when fiction does things like that. I remember the um, animated Spider-Man TV series. Yeah. Um, it goes standard as most Marvel stories do. They end up going into multiverse down the road when they try and figure out how to bring new versions of things but in one of them spider-man went to our reality and there's stan lee's on his back and he's just going so you're saying in your universe you wrote me as this comic book character <laughs> and he's like yeah i did as a matter of fact i did oh that's cool um yeah that, that was one of the animated series i think it was actually one of the 60s no 80s. no it wouldn't have been the one in the 60s i think it is Gen- I might not have been with the really static animation. Yeah, I think I genuinely think it ended the that famous crazy. Famous Spidey, uh, yeah, Spidey yeah. painting it. I, I, I could be completely misinterpreting. We're talking about how bad perception can be. This is yeah. me remembering. It's definitely one of the animated series, at least. Now, while we're talking about how bad perception can be, mm-hmm. I, I've just got to say something about illusion. Mm-hmm. Because storytelling is all illusion. Our sensory perception is all illusion. You were asking earlier, is there a place where ideas exist? That's all illusion. Mm -hmm. We live in these sacks of wet meat that are fed lies constantly, not deliberately, but we perceive all kinds of sensory information much more than we can process. So we have these mental shortcuts that allow us to process them by making huge assumptions, right? Lying to ourselves. Um, If you want someone to fall into a story of one sort as opposed to another, You just set them up. You prime them to be thinking one type of thing as opposed to another, right? So the loud bang can be a great relief or it can be terrifying, Yeah. right? The the soft scratching sound can be the monster under the bed or the kitten trying to get into your lap. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, with with that, I've, I've noticed just in myself, depending on factors unknown to me, sense, sense, sensory inputs like a touch on my arm can feel the most irritating thing in the world or the best thing in the world and it's it's all down to factors which i'm completely not in control of yeah yeah here here um and a good story takes control of those things right so that when the touch on your arm happens hmm. the audience is triggered the way you want them to be triggered yeah 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 it's i imagine it must be great to go and see an audience watch a film that you've made mm. and watch them react it is to it's, something that you did yeah that's it's one of the best or worst feelings in the world yeah. um is, is i remember the, the first time i had it happen was uh our the, one of the first short films i made was a 40 hour film project in 2014 nice. the first one i got screened on the cinema at least wow um cuz afterwards it got screened on the cinema and yeah, uh, we, it was fun. We made it with friends. But then we heard people laughing at our jokes. And I was like, cool, we didn't screw up completely. <laughs> people are enjoying this. Oh, that's there's that, that feeling of there's not much other art. Oh, there are. There are other art forms where you, you I mean, I'm not picking on you again, but performing music, you, you can immediately there see the reception yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, if you can interpret it correctly, it's another thing. Yeah. Um, I always have a hard time believing that people are actually applauding or what I've done. Mm. I, my default is to think that uh, they weren't really listening very closely or they wouldn't be applauding. Um, when I, I mentioned earlier in this episode that I, I um, loved comic strips when I was a little kid. Uh, when I first went off to university, I wanted to be involved in the newspaper, and I went and met with them and asked them, you know, what do you need? I can, I can write. Uh, I like sports. I'm involved in athletics. I could write about that. I'm involved in student. What, what can I do for the newspaper? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we got all the writing we need. And somebody said, well, we don't have a comic strip anymore. So I thanked them very much and came back the next day with a bunch of comic strips done and uh, ended up having some real success with it. 
It got syndicated and was carried at university newspapers across Canada. And I had this great experience where I, I uh, went on a date with a young lady and uh, we went back to her dorm room uh, to get her shoes or something like that. It was nothing illicit. And as we were walking down the hallway of her dorm, her neighbors had my comic strips on their doors. <laughs> and it just felt so amazing. Yeah. And I was stopped looking at one of them just thinking, how can this be? And a, a young woman said, oh, do you like that too? And I said, sometimes. And then a whole bunch of them started talking about the comic strip and yeah, which characters they liked. And I just sat there thinking, I'm going to start telling people that this is my comic strip. I, I signed it with an illegible signature so nobody knew. And I decided I'm going to start telling people. And uh, I was off at a party that night and um, mentioned to some folks that, oh, yeah, that, that, that's me, that comic strip. And the room went quiet. And the guy closest to me said, you should try making it funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's that's one of the hardest parts of creation is is it's it's it, you are opening yourself up. And it, that's especially so okay, when we're talking about this honesty in this place that you're tapping into and if if you're being honest and you're communicating something very personal, you're opening a door. You're opening a a, a gate right to your heart. So it hurts even more if an arrow flies in. And I think that's why so much of us walk around with walls up all the time. You're here. Is because we're, we're, we don't want to open ourselves up and communicate because we're all terrified of being hurt. Yeah, those uh, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the comic strip Charlie Brown, or other Peanuts, had a great version of that where uh, one of the young women who I think didn't stay around in the comic strip after the 1950s, one of the girls, turns to Charlie Brown and goes, bleh, with their tongue sticking out. And then the girls all walk away, and Charlie Brown is standing there with his hand on his chest, and he says, those bleh's just go right into your heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like, remember oh, that one. Uh, oh. I, I used to have a little comic book of a bunch of them. I, yeah. that, that one actually stuck with me. I remember that. I can I can see the drawing now with his nice. head hunched and folding. Yeah. 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 yeah, those were wonderfully powerful comic strips uh, Schultz was just a genius mm. and that's yeah it's, it's something that you see in children they've not learned they have to have walls up yet and they can run around and be open and honest completely um, then it's I don't know it's a, there, and then there's a magic to always being in that state yeah. that that you lose as you grow up um, I, that I complete agree. openness um, and Creative honesty as well. I, I was waiting, but I'd have whole universes going on while I was a kid, just all the time. That yeah. I, I would always want to go back and experience, like how much could I? How much was I actually visualizing? Because I remember it all being very, very vivid, like an overlay over reality. Right. That slowly over time disappeared. That would be a great comic strip or, yeah. or a movie to show that. Yeah. There's been a lot of stuff in the theaters lately about childhood friends and imaginary friends and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it'd be a nice way to do it if you could come up with the right way of showing that overlay on reality. I yeah, there is. I have phrase before, but I, I, I like that. There is. I mean, there's is it inside out. There's, a, there, well, there's some, some, there's some, there's literally some stories about that. Yeah. There. Yeah. There's the new one Losing. about imaginary friends, but I yeah. think there's two different films that are about childhood imaginary friends coming back. And yeah, there's that uh, recent one. Is it called Slumberland or Nemo? Where it basically said that the, the brilliant Windsor McKay comic strip from the 1920s Slumberland was probably actually set in the 1990s. And now here is the daughter of the main character. Hmm. Um, anyway, spoiler, sorry. Great, great movie. Surprisingly great movie. And, uh, okay, I, I, I did had – I'll explore this thought I had before because I, I, I thought about that before being in that open magical space. But there – you you pay attention to reality a little less in that state. And that's kind of what being an adult is about. You have to pay attention to everything else because it's up to you now to look after everyone else. Um, and you've got to be switched on and tuned into the, the physical, the mundane, the, the, 
you've got to perceive everything as best as possible. Yeah, and and survive it and navigate yeah. it in a way that allows you to support others. But maybe that's part of what people are escaping from mm -hmm. in delving so deeply into social media um, and video games and all of the other current distractions from reality that so many young people live in right now. Escapism, yeah. Yeah, uh, but not not escaping to a rich self-constructed or shared fantasy world that you and your friends or your family or you yourself have built up, but into a world of quick, reflexive chemical rewards for quick decisions. So the world of scrolling through TikTok, uh, no particular hatred against TikTok, but the world of scrolling through TikTok until you find the video that catches your eye or scrolling through Instagram until you find the image that, that catches your eye. Um, that's not the same kind of fantasy world that little kids are in when they're overlaying their yeah. imagination with the real world and creating a richer experience. Right? And even this idea of augmented reality through uh, special uh, glasses or glasses and headsets um, it isn't that kind of thing because it's information that other people are choosing to throw at you mm. rather than information that you are generating on the fly and then preserving. Yeah, or you're, you're curating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it would be an interesting thing to try to make a product like an Oculus, something like that, but where you generate the content and mm. you decide where it is and you share it with those you are closest to, not friends in a fantasy world that's really just using you for clicks but actual friends and if you could create a version of oculus that does that yeah i would love that if you could get to there that it could just be as fluid as well it, you talk about cam technology and um technology that doesn't get in the way and everything yeah. like that the technology that could do that very well would be amazing wonderful it, this is that's one of the reasons I, I am a creative is because that doesn't exist um so the way i have to make the worlds i want to make i have to make a film nice um that that's that's what drew me into it from the get-go i guess is this fundamental feeling of oh no it's disappearing it's going away and it's <laughs> childlike um attempt well not a childlike attempt but an attempt to get that childlike feeling back in many ways um, and that's what's, and I love, I love, I love work. I love being around creatives the most. Um, everyone can be creative, but I love when people are gathered around and aligned to creating, yeah. and everyone is opening up and coming into that space. Because when you've been in some of our writing sessions before as well, that's the th things I love most. Sure, sure, with humans get away, and you try and fight for your idea, and there's all these other things that could happen. But the whole act in itself of you're all pulling this thread and this story out of somewhere and you're trying to make it as best it could be but it's, it, it's just yeah it's one of my favorite things because everyone is opening themselves up a little bit and yeah. um For trying trying to be as nice to each other as possible in that, in that <laughs> while, space. while defending their idea whilst defending your idea strongly and letting them know why their idea was bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's a beautiful environment that kind of shared thing it's it's like when you're role-playing Mm, mm. Right. A, a, a well-run role-playing campaign smooths over all of the difficulties there because there's a position of authority and somebody else is making the decision so you don't have to debate them. You can debate what the party should do next, uh, but you're not going to debate reality. Mm. And I, uh, it's something I miss about role-playing games. Um, early next week, I'm going to have dinner with one of my nephews I've only seen once in the last couple of decades. And uh, I, I can't wait. He's a full-grown adult um, in every way. But I knew him when he was a little baby, and I knew him best when he was a little kid. And we used to go on adventures into his imaginary world mm. when he was small and I was big. And we would lose days mm -hmm. wandering around the world that he could see and he could help me see but I never really saw it. I could only see him seeing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a wonderful experience to do that. Um, I think about that all the time and him all the time because it's 
that's so fundamental to my own life that I got to share that with them. And I got to share that with other uh, nephews and a niece, and I, I got to share that with other people's kids, uh, most of whom are now adults. But uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing him. I don't know if he'll listen to this podcast, but I am tempted to ask him yeah. what he does to experience that kind of joy these days and whether he remembers what yeah. we used to do. Or if he does, will he be honest to it? Yeah. That, I can imagine that being a thing of talking to someone like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Probably. Oh, no, he's, he's an incredibly creative yeah. person. He lives Good. in the artistic side of I'm not that. saying that specifically, but there, no, no. there are types who would. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's so much so that it's a trope in fiction about uh, real-life childhood experiences. Yeah. And, uh, that great, uh, great movie Hook with Robin Williams. That's I've been I've been thinking about that a lot. Some when I won't have been talking yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a marvelous, marvelous version of that. Um, but yeah, the um, the the dinner will be wonderful either way because I miss him and I can't wait to learn what's going on in his life and see him as this adult that he is. Mm-hmm. But uh, I am interested to hear what he remembers about the hours we spent, if he remembers them, and what they were to him in his understanding of it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's... I've had random periods of reflection every now and then. But every now... I don't know what it is about your brain, but sometimes it will go into a space that it hasn't been in decades. And you go, oh, I forgot this was a feeling. I forgot this was a place of experience. Isn't that lovely? Um, just random memories will pop up, or you know, random yeah. a weird one. I just going going in the back of our garden, and I wasn't allowed to, but I could climb over the wall of the garden, and it would be this space in between, in between two gardens. So there's a wall. W- there's a wall between someone else's garden and a wall between someone else's garden. In between, there was just this space with trees and stuff like that. And it, nice. I remember going into there um, and one day finding uh, some sort of tubing, some sort of, I don't know, plumbing tubing or vacuum tubing, but it was a pipe that long. And then me and my other friend figured out if you swing it around in the air, it makes a whining <laughs> noise. And the stories that we would make up about the things you could conjure and call uh, oh, just by doing that. And lovely. yeah, no, that was one that just popped into my head the other day and I was like, I forgot that, that whole feeling. Um, yeah, and then as a creative, you want to be able to tap into things like that and try to communicate. Not not just the facts of the matter. Try to communicate what that feels like. That's what a lot of art is about. You're not trying to communicate the fact of the matter, you're trying to communicate the feeling. Yeah, because that's what we all have in common if we're lucky. Yeah. Right. Everyone who's lucky has some version of that living in their memory and their heart. Um, yeah, no, that's wonderful. I, I saw the uh, the musical Come From Away mm. at His Majesty's Theatre here in Aberdeen on uh, September 11th, the anniversary of the events depicted there. And I went into it after years of trying to avoid seeing the play or read too much about it. I, I just didn't want to know because I was involved. I was in a small town in Newfoundland when all that happened, and I'm one of the people who dealt with things. In a, in a very small way, I played a very small part in this huge international operation. I went to the show quite looking forward to it, and in the first few minutes was weeping, sitting in my chair in the theater, just weeping, hmm. because I was back there feeling the feelings of that first night. Um and actually, what hit me first was the feelings of that day when it happened and we saw it happening. They they depicted that better than anything else I've seen about it. And uh, But then showing the people reacting to their situation. Um, for those of you thinking about seeing the show, I'd spent a lot of time laughing out loud and cheering. Uh, it's a very, very good show, and it's very well done, and it's very uplifting. But in order to become uplifting... They have to gather the audience together emotionally and give them something to move up from. Yeah, And that yeah. show does it so well. Um, a number of different characters experiencing a number of different things all experience the same moment of horror that happened on September 11th. This particular moment of horror in September 11th, there have been other 
moments of horror on that same date for people from other uh, countries and cultures. But um, And I don't mean to disrespect them by talking about what happened in New York and, and Washington. Um, my point is, when they did the transformation scenes, the emotional switches scenes on the stage, I had that experience you were just talking about. I was back in a space emotionally that I had forgotten still exists. I, I had an intellectual memory of the rooms I was in and the smells of them and the feeling of the people and the, the sounds, the incredible richness of sound uh, and horrible richness of sound. Um, I had some intellectual memories of all of those things, but the storytelling on stage brought me back there viscerally. <laughs> And I had no choice but to weep. I was weeping before I knew it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's 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 the game of it, and that's um, ultimately the best advice that we can give to people. What are you communicating? Um, a lot of us. I used to get caught up in that. I, I wanted to be a filmmaker because initially, initially, I just thought they're cool and fun. But then, it took me a while to figure out that you've got to do it to communicate something and if you don't know what that is if you can't feel it yourself because you need to feel it yourself to be able to pull from it so you need to conjure it up and call it again in different ways to try and figure out what it is and use all the tools available to you to try and whatever your medium is to try and communicate that but you got to start there you got to dig deep and figure out what you're going to communicate and I, I, I feel I feel for some people starting out because a lot of the time, if you're if you're younger, some of the other than childhood, there's some some of the biggest things in your life haven't happened yet. Um, you haven't had the biggest tragedy of your life yet. You haven't had these highlights. Well, not highlights, but these. communicating those experiences you're here and you say take that feedback on board there are two kinds of feedback you shouldn't take on board otherwise listen to everything from everyone but if anybody tells you that your work is so bad you should never do it again yeah. ignore yeah. them don't listen to them and if anyone tells you that your work is so good you don't need to ever change it don't listen to them but otherwise get all the feedback you can and listen to everybody yeah and accept that John has just communicated many of them. Um, I communicate less of them. Those moments where that arrow flies straight into your heart, they're going to happen. Just take note that when it happens, you go, ah, there it is. That's what Jamie was talking about. Yes. It's a sharp little moment to ignore and keep pressing on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That arrow will stay there. Mm. And uh, if you decide you can't do anything because you've been wounded, then you won't do anything ever. Yeah, and uh, the, the good news is that you can reach over and tweak that arrow anytime you need to be reminded of your passions and mm. things you care about. Um, the good, the bad news is that other people can tweak it too. Yes, so. yes. Don't don't <laughs> don't careful. let it show that it's there. Um, uh, when yeah. someone nudges into it, and then those types of people that see, oh, that hurt you, and then they'll tug at it and press it. And yeah, that's one of our shared lies. Is, yeah. is we all pretend that we don't have that. Mm. so that we can all function. And the people who are willing to acknowledge that you have it come in two sorts, the ones who are going to help you protect you mm. and the ones who, as, as you were just saying, are going to take advantage of it to manipulate you. It would be nice if uh, if they could be weeded out as children and corrected in their behavior. Mm. But uh, unfortunately, they exist in large number. Yes, so be wary as you walk through this journey of creativity in life that 
find the good ones around you, um, the ones who make you strive to be better. Always aim high. Look at, compare yourself against the very best as well um, because it will make you keep growing. I find that to be a great tool. Don't just look at everyone else around you because you'll all plateau. Aim high, um, very high. Look, don't just look about people in current time. Look at that current space. Look at people in time. There have been people who echo throughout history, um, creatives, and stand in awe of their work and aim for the divine as they did. Yeah, 100%, Jamie. If, if you're doing comedy and you haven't watched Chaplin, Mm -hmm. then you're not doing comedy. Yeah, yeah. Right? If you're doing tragedy and you haven't watched Kurosawa, then you're not doing tragedy. 100%. Yeah. Okay, guys, we're going to finish it up there. I think there's some, place, <laughs> some practical little things for you. Um, but as always, if you listened this far, thank you very, very much. We hope, hope very much so that you got something useful out of this. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Sock Talk is a production from the Robert Gordon University School of Computing. Today's episode was brought to you by the letter pi and the number pi.